So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Waccamaw Conference webinar series. And thank you all for taking the time to attend our webinar today. My name is Maeve Snyder. I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Our webinar today is a panel discussion about conserved lands in the Waccamaw watershed. And I'll introduce our panel speakers and my co-host in just a minute. But before I do, I wanted to give a few quick tips and reminders. Um, so during the webinar, you're gonna be muted with your video turned off. We suggest closing out other programs on your computer. Um, and if you're having technical issues, if you just leave and rejoin the webinar, that often will fix the problem. Or if you're having te technical questions, you can put them in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll see a raised hand button. We're actually not gonna use that today. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. It works like a chat box. Um, and we encourage you to ask questions. You can ask a question at any time during the webinar. We might save it for a Q&A period at the end of a presentation, but we do see it and we'll come back to it. All right, so I quickly wanna give an introduction to the Waccamaw Conference and the organizers that uh, put together this year's conference. Um, the conference was organized by Winyaw Rivers Alliance and the Waccamaw Riverkeeper, the North Inlet Winyaw Bay Near, American Rivers, and the Coastal Waccamaw Stormwater Education Consortium. So I'll actually ask uh, one of our organizing partners, Kara, to come on to do a quick intro. Thanks, Maeve. Um, I'm Kara. I'm your Waccamaw Riverkeeper with Winyard Rivers Alliance, and um, we are really excited that we get to do something a little bit different with the Waccamaw Conference this year. And part of that is the Source Seminar Series, which is a mouthful. Try saying that five times fast. Um, but we're really excited uh, to welcome our panel today, and we hope that y'all enjoy our panel. So thanks for coming. Thanks, Kara. So I'll quickly introduce our panel speakers today and then I'll let them, you know, tell you, tell them, tell you more about themselves when they give their presentations. But our panelists today include Craig Sasser, who's the manager of the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge, Lyles Cooper Lyles, the executive director of the PD Land Trust, and Keith Bradley, um, he's a botanist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And we're really excited to, to hear from them and uh, have a discussion afterwards. And we definitely encourage all participants to engage with the speakers, ask questions. We, we hope that this can be a great conversation. Um, a quick background of the, the Waccamaw watershed, because that's really the, the basis and the place that we're going to be focused on today. It's home to the Waccamaw River Blue Trail and spans two states, traveling 140 miles, starting up at Lake Waccamaw and flowing all the way down to Winyah Bay. So we wanna start with a quick poll just to hear from everyone watching. Where are you in the Waccamaw watershed? So you should see a poll come up right now. And I see some answers coming in. We'll give it just one more second. All right, Kara, can you show the results? Awesome. So it looks like the majority of people are in Conway or the Horry County area, but we have people all the way up uh, in the North Carolina, South Carolina state line area down to Winyah Bay. So we've covered a lot of the watershed today. And I actually just wanna quickly show how um, during the Waccamaw Conference, we are covering this entire area. Week one, we focused on Lake Waccamaw. Week two, we focused on the state line area. Last week, we heard about, um, we heard from the Horry County Museum and the history of the Conway area. And this week we're focused on the Waccamaw uh, Wildlife Refuge area and the Waccamaw Neck. Um, but I know that we'll, we'll talk about other areas in the whole watershed as well. Next week, our focus is going to be on Linyaw Bay. And because we're focused on conserved lands today, I actually ask, want to ask one more quick poll to get people in this, um, 
habitat and uh, land conservation mindset. So Kara, can you go ahead and launch the poll? So we're curious to know about your favorite types of habitat within the Waccamaw watershed and the watershed's home to a, a diversity of ecosystems and habitat types. And this is not an encompassing list. <laughs> All right, we'll give it one more second. All right, can we go ahead and show the results? Cool, so a few favorites. Um, the number one, the estuary and the salt marsh. Um, since I'm from the National Estuarine Research Reserve, I have to say that's the, the correct choice. <laughs> but they're all right answers. So forested wetlands and swamps and obviously the Waccamaw River, awesome. All right, so thank you all for doing the poll. And with that, I actually wanna turn it over to our speakers. We're gonna start off with each panelist giving a quick presentation, um, introducing themselves and their organization. And then we'll move into a facilitated Q&A and some discussion. So our first speaker is Craig Sasser. Craig, whenever you're ready, can go ahead. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Craig Sasser. I grew up in Horry County on the Waccamaw River. So I have been blessed with being on this project um, for almost my entire career with Fish and Wildlife Service, which is uh, 26 years. Um, I grew up paddling the, the part of the Waccamaw um, up above Conway uh, from Highway 90, almost North Carolina line, all the way down to the city. Uh, I fell in love with this river when I was at a very young age. Um, and so many, many years later, I had the opportunity to start out my career as a private lands um, a, a focus area biologist. So I was working um, primarily in the Winyah Bay focus area. Um, this group of, of conservation-minded, like-minded uh, individuals that involve state, uh, private nonprofits, um, private landowners, uh, the international paper was on the task force and um, US Fish, uh, which is, was my position. We, we started looking at um, how to protect the lower end of the Waccamaw River, primarily focusing on waterfowl habitats using the uh, North American Waterfowl Management Plan and the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture to kind of guide us in identifying the most important habitats for wintering waterfowl. And, and as this plan expanded, we started including shorebirds and wading birds and lots of other migratory birds. Um, and so the scope of the original design of our conservation plan changed over time, but a lot of those habitats were used by all these different species. Um, most of it was focused in the early days on uh, managed wetlands, tidal managed uh, impoundments, historic rice fields, some of which were managed, some of which have been slowly um, reverting back to the natural habitats, which uh, originally were forested wetlands. Um, and so a lot of the early conservation work uh, started out doing conservation easements primarily with nonprofits like PD Land Trust, Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited Trust, and um, and and there were some state acquisitions that um, helped expand Samworth around the early uh, phase of the Winya Bay Focus Area. Um, my role changed in the early uh, 90s, around 1994, uh, when Sandy Island was proposed. It was, Sandy Island at the time was a private uh, land holding in the middle of the Winyah Bay focus area. Um, it was a primary target for the task force to find conservation or seek conservation on that property. Uh, there was a proposal for a road project uh, that would have opened that property up for logging and, and future development, a development plan 
uh, was uh, discovered. And uh, if you haven't seen it on SCTV, there's a great documentary about saving Sandy Island. Um, but long story short, the task force proposed a national wildlife refuge um, to protect Sandy Island. Uh, the developers, the owners and developers were working very hard to get their permit for the bridge and um, the uh, refuge plan, uh, which started out with Sandy Island expanded. Um, over time, we had to do an environmental impact statement to look at the, the uh, impacts of creating a, a national wildlife refuge. Um, and the scope of the project expanded beyond Sandy Island. That was the very early phase of um, swallowtail kites, which are a very beautiful and, and iconic bird that is kind of the flagship of the refuge. They were just discovered in um, the uh, kind of lower Waccamaw upper or, or lower PD uh, area. And uh, the first nest was found around 1994. Um, so we started uh, doing some kind of broader land-based planning to preserve enough habitat for roughly 30 pairs. Um, back then we didn't have great science, but we uh, guesstimated that there might be, or that the, the habitat of the lower Waccamaw PD watershed might uh, provide habitat for up to 30 pairs. So um, we looked at lands that were already preserved and we, and we figured out a plan to match up with those properties um, and expand up the rivers uh, to provide enough habitat for these 30 uh, pairs of nesting swallowtail kites. Um, and so what happened was our acquisition boundary uh, expanded from below Sandy Island all the way up the, the Great PD to the confluence of the Little PD and then up the Waccamaw to just below the city of Conway. Um, the acquisition boundary uh, in the, um, the final EIS uh, environmental impact statement was 54,000 acres. Um, it has been expanded through a minor, a couple of minor expansions to almost 59,000 acres. Um, we currently manage about 37,000 acres, some of which a large part of that we own, but uh, we we have a lease agreement for Sandy Island um, through the Nature Conservancy, and then we we lease about eight thousand acres from uh, the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources on the Waccamaw. And um, our refuge programs, um, they're directed a lot at habitat management for a wide range of species, from wintering waterfowl to uh, neotropical migratory birds, um, obviously swallowtail kites have expanded their range into the refuge in a big way. So uh, you should be seeing those birds um, along the Waccamaw and PD River in pretty good numbers these days. And, and I encourage everybody to call South Carolina Center for Birds of Prey or, or email them. Uh, they have a link where you can go in and, and report your sightings of swallowtail kites, it's very important information that we use um, as we plan refuge programs, as we look at uh, land acquisition and lots of other uh, habitat management strategies to improve habitat for swallowtail kites. Um, lots of species use the forested wetlands of the refuge. Um, the, uh, the, the, the newest and most, I guess, important roles the refuge have been playing is not newest, but uh, I guess emphasized, uh, over, uh, um, recently emphasized was the flood uh, water protection, um, uh, the stormwater services that these swamps and, and, uh, and wetlands provide during flood events. Obviously, um, we have had, had enormous amounts of flooding over the past five years. Um, and it's impacted the refuge uh, in, in a lot of ways, primarily with, um, you know, water quality issues with uh, debris that has floated into our swamps. Uh, and so anyway, lots of projects coming out of that that will include cleanups and um, other features for habitat uh, improvement. 
Um, I guess the last thing I'll just mention, uh, we have a pretty uh, extensive public use program. So we've got recreation areas um, scattered through the refuge, got a visitor center that's been closed since the pandemic started, but hopefully it'll open up in the near future. We get uh, about 4,000 school kids a year through the uh, visitor center and um, our Cox Ferry Lake recreation area is probably the most widely used right, right now with in the neighborhood of about 35,000 car visits a year. It's up near Coastal Carolina University and the city of Conway. And uh, I guess the last thing I'll mention is we recently did a boundary modification. So we've added more land up through the city of Conway. Uh, we hope to, to open up a canoe kayak launch site near the city in the next uh, month or two. And um, anyway, uh, I will try to, share my screen at the end, maybe with some contact information. If anybody wants to do uh, research on the refuge, look at maps and where our public use areas are. Awesome, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, we would definitely love to hear, you know, how people can get in touch and get involved. So we can come back to that later. But um, now I want to turn it over to our next panelist, uh, Lyles Cooper Lyles with the PD Land Trust. So Lyles, whenever you're ready, you can pull up your screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me and appreciate being included in this today. I am the executive director for PD Land Trust. I've been with them for about six years now, and I did grow up in the PD. I lived in both Sherall and Florence growing up and had the opportunity to spend a lot of time all over the whole watershed, everywhere from Marlboro and Chesterfield County down to Georgetown and Horry County. Um, I think spent, when my family went to the beach, we went to Polly's and um, had a lot of friends that spent a lot of time on Black River and Waccamaw and PD and Lynch's. So grew up really knowing the land, but didn't start in land protection. I actually went into sales and worked for economic development and hotel development, and then worked for a couple of nonprofits. Um, took a step back uh, once I had a baby and needed something that was a little bit more nine to five and not 70 hours a week in traveling and had already been affiliated with the land trust. So um, it was a good fit for me. Um, quick story personally that ties me to the land. When I was four years old, we were invited to um, come over to have a picnic over on Black Creek, which is in Darlington County. And um, it was a bunch of families that lived in the area and we had a big picnic and then floated down the creek. And I was four. And two years ago, my son was four years old. And we did that same picnic with all those same families down the same route of the Black Creek. And it looked the exact same. And the reason was, was because those families had all had the forethought to permanently protect their property, which in turn protected the Black Creek area. And it turns out now I understand that those are the same families that founded the PD Land Trust about 21 years ago. So. I do have a love for what we do as an organization, working with private landowners, but also um, you know, appreciate all the organizations that help people enjoy and protect our, our many natural resources. I'm gonna try to share my screen with you guys. Um, let's see. Okay. Y'all see the slideshow? Yep, looks good. Okay, all right, all right. So PD Land Trust uh, was formed back in 1999 as an all volunteer uh, organization. And we uh, have grown now to be uh, one of the larger regional land trusts in the state and the only regional land trust permanently and specifically serving the PD watershed. 
We accomplish our mission mostly by partnering with private landowners to place voluntary conservation easements on their properties and through educational programming. Our, our mission you know, is to conserve and promote that appreciation of the significant natural, agricultural, and historical resources of the PD watershed in South Carolina. We currently have a staff of uh, six plus one part-time. Thanks to Darla Moore's support, we recently added a new land protection staff member and he will be helping us focus on our GIS mapping research and documentation. We also have a board of 21 members and they come from our nine focus counties in the PD watershed. With a small staff and a really large geographic area, we rely on our dedicated volunteer board members to help us in the counties where they own land, live and work. So we have um, local representatives in both Ori and Georgetown counties in the Waccamaw watershed. We partner with a lot of local, state, federal and private organizations through the watershed to further our conservation efforts, including um, do a lot of work with Craig and we, we're on a lot of committees, a lot of committees. Um, but what is a conservation easement it, it, as a basic overview? It's a perpetual legal agreement. It is forever. The conservation values are defined by the IRS as four specific items, open space, wildlife habitat, historic land or structure, outdoor public recreation or education. Public access is not required. And I always point that out because a lot of people um, associate conservation easements only with public access. Although public access is great, um, it is not mandated for private conservation easements. All conservation easements are voluntary. Some people hear the word conservation easement and they think of um, like condemnation, somebody's taking something from me. Um, that's not what we do. We work with private landowners to figure out what they want to create as a land legacy, what they want done and not done with their property in the future. And the biggest things that we work on trying to protect is keeping large parcels together, so not dividing the property, um, minimizing the number of structures on the property, no commercial activity, and no industrial activity or mining. Um, it can be a lot of people um, don't think they can do an easement if they have a mortgage on their property, and most of the time we actually can do that. Um, we have a landowner guide on our website and also available to be mailed out or emailed if anybody's interested. It tells you more than you're ever going to know, want to know about a, a, a conservation easement, but it also talks through all of the uh, state and federal tax incentives for land conservation. We, like I said, we cover the whole PD watershed, which is um, a focus on nine counties. And if you look at the map, you kind of see all of the major rivers. They funnel down together, all down into the Winyah Bay. So the work that we're doing up in um, Marlboro County or Dillon County on the rivers, it funnels down to Orion Georgetown. So um, you know, all the work that we do on all of our rivers and all of our counties helps us, especially with the filtration of our major water systems as you move down through the watershed. Let's see. Um, this kind of shows a, a picture of some of the Waccamaw watershed, and you can see what lands are currently protected. The orange represents the um, private land that is under conservation easement. The red around the orange represents conservation easements that are held by PD Land Trust. Um, and then the dark green represents federal land under conservation. The green outline is the, what's under in state conservation and the purple is local government. The red stars on there you see are projects that we have either recently done, closed, and haven't been added to the map yet, or that we're closing later this year. 
Um, we have a lot of conserved property, um, but there's a lot more to do. The, the overall goal with conservation easements and land protection is, is to create greenways and blueways, not just um, conserved properties here, there, and everywhere, but that connection to be able to provide for um, habitats, you know, water filtration, and um, outdoor recreation, all the things that we enjoy in South Carolina. This picture is a, a photograph taken by David Soliday and it hangs up in our office. And I love it because it really reminds me every day of why we do what we do and how it comes together. These are where all the rivers come together and spill into Winya Bay. And that's, that's what all of our work is about is protecting everything from the top to bottom. A lot of people think that conservation easements are, are, or land trusts are anti-development, um, tree huggers, um, the list goes on. We're actually, um, we actually support a lot of uh, economic development um, with the combined incomes from farming and forestry and tour outdoor recreation and tourism it makes up you know, such a large part of South Carolina's economy. And not every property is a good property to put under conservation easement. Not every property is a good property to develop. And all, all we like to do is partner with individuals and organization to help strategically plan for the future and make sure that we're utilizing the best possible resources in the best way. Um, as an organization, we work with a lot of uh, really loyal, donors, supporters, um, partners to continue to create a community of conservation for the next generation. Everything we do today is for tomorrow and we appreciate every everybody that helps us along the way and uh, all the organizations that help us move forward and increase our protected resources. I will Turn it back over to Maeve. Thanks so much, Lyles. That was a great introduction. Um, all right, at this point, we can move on to our final speaker, Keith Bradley with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. So Keith, whenever you're ready, um, we can switch screen sharing. All right, can you see that to start with? Not yet. Not yet. Well, let me just start to, let me just introduce myself for the moment. So I'm Keith Bradley. I'm a botanist with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And I'm kind of a surrogate here, even though I've spent a lot of time in the Waccamaw for Trapper Fowler, who's um, our heritage preserve manager for the Waccamaw um, River Heritage Preserve. He, he couldn't be here today. So I am, unlike my, co-panelists. I am a newcomer to South Carolina. I grew up in southern Florida and Miami where I spent my career doing rare plant conservation and um, habitat protection and habitat conservation. And since moving to South Carolina about eight years ago, I've been involved in a lot of rare plant mapping and rare plant conservation across the state. And I got to know Craig Sasser really well working in for the National Wildlife Refuges across South Carolina, including the Waccamaw River Heritage Preserve, um, and also did contract work for South Carolina Department of Natural Resources for a while, where I worked in the Waccamaw River Heritage Preserve itself. So I've been on about every part of the river from uh, Samworth up to the state line. Um, currently, I've been working for DNR for just over a year um, as a botanist doing work on rare plant conservation and heritage preserve management across the state. So if we can try to share my screen here. How are we looking, Maeve? Uh, not seeing it yet. Um, you should have screen sharing though. All right, let's see what I'm doing wrong. Ah, there we go. 
How's that look? Or am I on the wrong one? Nope, looks great. All right, sounds good. So I'm going to focus on talking about the, the Waccamaw River Heritage Preserve. Um, and the South, so uh, my responsibility as a botanist with, is with the South Carolina Heritage Trust Program, which was created in 1976. And our main focus is land acquisition and subsequent management of, of natural uh, and cultural heritage preserves across the state. Um, since 1976, we've acquired over 83,000 acres um, for conservation. Uh, we, uh, and then a lot of our subsequent activities are actually management and conservation of those heritage preserves and providing multiple uses. It's not just we buy something and keep people out. We want multiple opportunities for public use from nature observation to hiking to hunting to fishing, kayaking, etc. Um, we want people to enjoy these special places that we've been acquiring. We have heritage preserves across the state. We've got about 100 heritage preserves from um, the Waccamaw River uh, up to Oconee and Pickens County. So we've got some really fantastic and special places. My focus, since I'm a botanist, is I have to plug my, what I do is rare plant tracking and data management uh, across the state, conservation within our heritage preserves, helping guide people like Trapper, our heritage preserve manager, manager on how to preserve the resources and heritage preserves. I'm also very active in our land acquisition process with the Heritage Trust Program on the Habitat Protection Committee. We've been doing this since the 1970s and we're continuing to add new properties um, for conservation, including along the Waccamaw River. Um, I do a lot of work with rare plant reintroductions and rescues, uh, invasive species detections and uh, eradication, managing endangered ecosystems and landscapes, and also really active in the botanical sciences um, in general. These heritage trust properties um, often protect plant species that are nowhere else in the world. For example, Carolina hedge nettle is only down at kind of the mouth of Winnie Bay in two spots, the Sandy Coastal Reserve and the Yaki Center, only on our heritage preserves. So there are some plant species out there that are that are extremely special to us. So the Waccamaw River Heritage Preserve starts at the state line and comes down almost to Hidden River Road at Red Bluff Landing. The Heritage Preserve was established in 1991. Uh, we currently protect about 5,300 acres, although that's expanding, and that includes about 30 miles of the river. So this is up, all upstream of Conway. It's a really unique river. Um, if you spend any time on the rivers across the state, Waccamaw is a really special character for several reasons. It's our only river that originates in a Carolina Bay, um, like, which is Lake Waccamaw up in North Carolina. But kind of the, the special character, it's a Blackwater River, which is typical of, of South Carolina and Southeastern Coastal Plain rivers, but it's actually a very broad floodplain with oxbows and it has physio, physio, physical characters more of a brownwater river. And actually the, the fact is it probably originated in the Piedmont as a brownwater river and then became isolated by um, an uplift of the Cape Fear Fault in North Carolina. And, then became a Blackwater River. So it's got um, some unusual features, including this really broad floodplain, oxbow lakes, sandy uplands that actually are quite xeric, but do flood periodically. So here's an oxbow and this is just gorgeous white sand. Oops, ah, sorry about that. And especially in the late summer, when the water levels are dropping, it's these just gorgeous white sandbars develop along the, the banks of the river, which are you know, really attractive and great for getting out and taking a picnic if you're, if you're kayaking. This unique geology is really resulted in some really weird biota. Um, this pygmy spider lily is only along the Waccamaw River in North Carolina and South Carolina, and, but we've got a lot of other rare plants in the ecosystem as well. Plymouth gentian, which is more northern things, Sarvis holly, um, 
spatter dock, which is abundant along the Obakama River, but it's one of the only places in the world where it grows. Extremely high density of rare plants up and down the river, especially on these sandbars along the river. It's also a really important corridor for, for wildlife as well, such as black bears. We try to provide as many um, recreational opportunities as we can. It's a popular place for kayakers, um, hunters used to preserve as well, um, fishermen. And a lot of what we do is uh, management of the property uh, to preserve its character, including doing a lot of prescribed burning, exotic plant control is, is always an important thing that we need to keep doing. And, detecting exotic plants as they come in and eradicating before they become a big problem and change, um, cause problems to the ecosystem. But longer term, we're still working in filling in gaps. We have several active projects, which I can't talk about exactly where they are, but you know, we, we, our heritage preserve is not contiguous right now. We've got some really long stretches, but we've also got some gaps as you can see. So trying to fill in in as many of these holes as possible to preserve as much of this watershed as we can is, is one of our goals. So we've got several active conservation acquisition projects, including potentially expanding downstream somewhere. So um, you can check out, uh, participants can check out our property lines and get information about the property on our website. Um, we just updated all of our boundaries, so our maps are brand new. This website interface is going to change pretty soon, but the data is all up to date now, um, and including specific information about Waccamaw River Heritage Preserve itself. So, Maeve? All right, thanks, Keith. Um, let's actually stop that screen share for now and we can okay. all come back on screen. There we go. Thanks, Keith. Um, thank you for that, that great overview. Um, and thank you to all our panelists. So at this point, we're going to switch to more of a facilitated discussion. And we actually already have some questions in the Q&A. For participants, feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, and I have some questions we can circle back to as well. But I want to start off with the questions in the Q&A box. And these questions can be for specific people, or they can be for the whole group. Um, and I think this first one might be in particular for Lyles, but I want anyone to chime in if they have, uh, have any input on this. So we had a question, what are the minimum acreage requirements for land preservation? How does one go about gaining consideration for conservation? Okay, sure. Um, thank you for your question. The, there's no minimum acreage for a conservation easement. We have, um, easements that range from 13 acres to 2,100 acres. Even the best conservationists in the world usually aren't going to put property under conservation unless it makes financial sense. It is an economy of scale um, thing. So sometimes if you have um, very rural property that has a very, very low appraised value it, and it's a very small property, it might not make financial sense but then again, you've got a lot of property that is very high value in the um, Waccamaw watershed that um, could make sense even as a smaller property. <clears throat> as far as how you go about getting consideration for an easement, um, we only work with private landowners. We, we, we are not an advocacy organization and we do not um, bully private landowners into forcing them to try to protect their mm -hmm. land. Um, we work with voluntary private landowners. Um, if you're a private landowner and you want to work with us to see if it might make sense for you, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. It's completely confidential. Um, we can kind of give you some examples. Uh, we can't give you legal or tax advice, but we can give you, um, you know, very similar examples of how easements have worked for other people and then work through with you what you may want to have happen um, with your property in the future. That's great, thanks. 
Uh, Craig or Keith, do you have anything to, to add to this question of, you know, for a landowner or someone interested in conservation? Uh, I'll just add that I think it is a, a fabulous tool that has protected some very, very important acres uh, of habitat and open space and view sheds um, and probably one of the best tools in the toolbox. The state can't buy everything and the federal government can't buy everything. And so um, it adds a lot of diversity to the watershed to keep as much of that in private ownership as, as possible. Um, a lot of these easements are very, I'd say, uniform between nonprofits. Some um, each nonprofit has a specialty that they focus on, but um, they the easement language is very similar. So um, you know, it, it it is a really good tool for like-minded private landowners to collaborate and and develop conservation communities where. Um, Everybody in the neighborhood kind of knows that things are going to stay pretty much the same for in perpetuity. Um, so uh, I, um, my dad has got property up in Conway on the Waccamaw and down in uh, on the PD in Plantersville, and we've placed easements on both of those properties, and um, it's been a really good experience as a private landowner as well. Great, thanks. So we have another question in the Q and A box, um, and you know, you all touched on the unique biodiversity. There are you know rare species in the Waccamaw watershed, the Winyah Bay watershed. Um, this question asks, what is the current federal and state status of the carnivorous plant species that we have here? Okay, um, we've got um, really diverse assemblage of rare plant species and of carnivorous plant species in South Carolina. A lot of them are quite common. You can go into a lot of refuges, preserves, national park units and see them um, from the mountains to the coast. The rarest in the Waccamaw uh, River watershed is Venus flytraps. And that has the biggest conservation concern. It's got an extremely small global range. It's only known from South Carolina, currently only from two, popula two, big, two population areas in Horry County. It used to be more widespread, but that's all we know about right now. Um, there's a lot of it in, in and around the Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. Uh, and it also extends up into North Carolina. So it is currently not legally protected in South Carolina. Um, we do not have any Endangered Species Act on a state level in South Carolina. So none of our carnivorous plants are legally protected themselves. The, Venus flytrap is under review by the Fish and Wildlife Service for listing as an endangered species uh, or threatened species, but that decision has not been made yet. Data is currently being collected to evaluate it. That said, um, we had an incident of poaching uh, pitcher plants um, on one of our heritage reserves this week, or last week as a matter of fact, and whether something is listed as rare or not, any plant Taking a plant or animal from anybody else's property is illegal. So the so coming into one of our heritage preserves or a national wildlife refuge or private property itself and stealing carnivorous plants is always illegal, unless you have the landowner's permission. So we do have other species of carnivorous plants like, like sweet mountain pitcher plant, which is up in Pickens County, which is a federally listed endangered species. And Keith, that would include right of ways, long highways, and other things as well. Yeah, it's it's theft. So yeah, yeah. it's yeah. And the same goes for the refuge; those plants can't be removed. Yeah. That's great. I'll ask a follow up question because we started off this webinar series talking about Lake Waccamaw, which, if anyone saw that. Uh, seminar we talked about the endemic species there you know they're found nowhere else in the world and then Keith mentioned these plants that only live near the mouth of Winyah Bay. Yeah. Um, so for any of our, our panelists how do you explain to people the value of um, rare species or of biodiversity generally? I've been asked this question, I'd be curious to hear what other people have to say, but I've asked this, been asked this question a lot and, you know, a, a default answer is always something like, you know, maybe these rare plants have some kind of medicinal value or, 
these are going to be valuable to us um, in some way. And I don't, I just don't like that answer. I mean, yeah, that's in part true, but especially for people who, you know, for me growing up in Miami or Craig growing up in South Carolina, these are our history. These are our heritage. And if you're, whether you're a hunter or hiker or kayaker, and you grew up in a particular area and you spend any time out in the woods, you may not recognize the individual species, but they make up an ecosystem that you're in touch with in some way. I mean, these are part of what makes South Carolina, South Carolina. So it's important for us to preserve them. Thanks. I completely yeah. agree. I think that keeping all of the parts, um, it, it's like a very large puzzle with millions of pieces. And um, if you recklessly throw pieces away, the picture goes away. And so uh, keeping this system intact, I think the PD Waccamaw watershed is the third largest watershed on the East Coast. Um, and we're blessed in many respects that there are, there are dams on the PD, but uh, I think maybe seven, but they're all up at the upper end of it. So uh, for the most part, these are pretty free flowing natural systems uh, that have been shaped um, and are very diverse with, you know, millions of years of influence and um, they're just very important areas to protect. Great, thanks. All right, um, well, and I saw Lyles, you were able to answer another question in the Q&A box so people can see that typed response. Um, another question that came in, uh, this person lives in the Waccamaw Neck and they're concerned about um, pressure from development. They're seeing a lot of um, land sales, including forested wetlands, um, upland pine habitat. And I think they feel, you know, there's a sense of urgency there. Um, and they're curious if there are any efforts to create a wildlife corridor. Um, any comments on that? I'll take, I'll start with that one. Um, there's a lot of efforts. Uh, there, there's not one single effort to create a wildlife corridor. It is more so of a overall conservation protected area corridor. Um, there's different entities that focus more on habitat um, than on other resources, but there's a lot of partnerships uh, throughout um, the watershed and specifically in the uh, Waccamaw watershed that are very focused on that. Um, unfortunately, we have to have the agreement of the landowner. Um, it, it's not a, um, you know, we can do, we do landowner gatherings and specifically target, you know, certain areas, invite people to come and learn about uh, land conservation. But in the end of the day, unless somebody's willing to look at the opportunity to put it under conservation easement, we can't do anything about it. Now, a lot of times we do work with other entities um, from the land trust side, like we work with Craig or DNR or other um, organizations to try to work with them to put properties under conservation easement and then eventually put it into the hands of the public, either DNR or Wildlife Refuge. Um, and so there, there are a lot of yes and no. Craig, you want to jump on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take Craig, a step. Craig, Craig and Keith are trying to buy as much as they can, trust me. And that's not easy. It, <laughs> our, our acquisition program is very slow moving. So it takes generally two years at, at the earliest to do a land deal. And when you're competing with um, Horry County uh, real estate markets, that makes it really challenging. Um, the landowners typically really, really want the refuge to be the end user of that property. And they're willing to wait. And that's where nonprofits come in. Uh, if, if there's funding to acquire tracks, then, then um, there's a handful of our partners that will step in and do a deal and hold it for us. Um, but uh, there's no doubt Horry County is one of the fastest growing areas uh, and Georgetown. Both counties are uh, growing very fast, especially along the eastern side of the refuge. 
and um, the land use changes are very extreme. And, um, you know, when you go in a natural system, let's say Bull Island or the floodplain of the Waccamaw or Sandy Island or any of these really unique places that have been preserved and kept intact for a pretty long time. I mean, some, some areas have cypress trees that I would, I would guess are in the thousand year range. Uh, and, and you see the natural system at work with all of the diversity of species. And then you get out of your, get out of your kayak and you start down highway 17 and you see a same size area that you just visited that has been clear cut and every stick has been taken out and you realize how much habitat loss for a wide range of species might have taken place while this was going on and you know really and truly it it, it comes down to elected officials deciding what we want to sell uh, in Ori and Georgetown County. Right now it's quality of life and a lot of that quality of life depends on the rivers, the estuaries, the open space, the opportunities to take your family out on a barrier island and not see anybody else on 4th of July. I mean, it's hard to find on the East Coast. And so we have an incredible place and, and, and a lot of it's been preserved by just incredible conservationists that, that were willing to not develop a place like um, North Island or Yawkey or South Island and lots of different properties. Um, and, um, and, and it's easy to sell houses in this area and sell that quality of life. Um, but if we don't do the right thing, if we don't figure out what the carrying capacity of our landscape is, uh, we're going to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And so um, that's a really important thing and I hope in the future that, you know, elected officials will look at quality over quantity when they do landscape planning and zoning and making decisions about what we're selling and what, what, it's, what we protect really represents what we, what we stand for as a community uh, protecting our heritage. So it's really important to uh, protect as much as we develop. And let me point out that, as, you know, as Craig said, the development pressure is causes other problems just because we protect a property, say we have Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve, we have to continue to manage that property. And if people are building houses and hospitals, as is proposed right up next to our property lines, it means that that puts our heritage preserve at risk because we can't manage it effectively. Um, we, uh, we have uplands that we have to burn, they're fire dependent, and if we have a hospital right next door we have to deal with that smoke and we have to make decisions about whether we can effectively manage something or not. So, yeah, Keith, Keith brings up a great point. Um, you know, and, and if those areas aren't burned, then ultimately they will burn because they have always burned. Uh, I, I think one of my first experiences with wildfires was when I was about nine and, and basically that Lewis ocean Bay area was burning for weeks and, and it was, very hard back then to get out and there weren't as many houses around it yeah um there's been discussions in the past about smoke easements in communities if you want to build next to uh, uh lewis ocean bay heritage preserve then you better be used to seeing smoke every year um and and accept it as part of your neighborhood and if you don't like that then you need to find somewhere else to move but um those are the those are the kind of things that need to be outward thinking strategies for the counties uh, involved and, and the planners and the elect, elected officials to, to manage this growth. Um, we don't have to sell everything at one time. Yeah, I don't, the only thing I have to add on that is I do think um, both both counties in, in the Waccamaw watershed have great planning departments and their staff knows what needs to be done but the planning department can't do anything that the county council does not allow them to do. So they know what restrictions need to be in place. They know what needs to be controlled with development and overdevelopment and flooding and you know construction, but they can't change the laws. The politicians tell them what to do. And unfortunately, most 
of the decisions made are based on profit for development. It's just the world we live in. Thanks for all those answers. I think we have time for one more question and then I'll need to wrap up with some uh, last reminders. But this question asks, what are the best Facebook groups or pages to follow to help spread the word? And I actually wanna kind of expand that and just ask, where can people go to learn more about your agencies and organizations and how can they get involved? I will, um, I'd be happy just to share some contact information um, and our website has a, a lot of um, links, but also information. I think the I know the refuge and DNR have great websites, but there's, you know, uh, the organizations like the, um, we're all partners in the Upper Waccamaw Task Force and um, all of those partners in that have great resources that are all specific, but all are working towards, you know, similar um, end goals for conservation. So maybe we could um, share some of those links. Maybe. Yeah, we can send out um, links and resources to the, the participants afterwards. Um, okay. But also just good to, to hear what you recommend people do to, to learn more. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think pro probably one of the most important things and 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 welcome all National Wildlife Refuge has got a Facebook page and also I mean you can Google and find a lot of our maps and information but but I think one of the biggest things is is um, you know think globally and act locally and so there's there's ways to get involved in your community um, uh, to I mean I, I can tell you every day we get hundreds of calls about baby birds and baby squirrels and baby rabbits and there's some nonprofit organizations out there that take care of a lot of that there's the center for birds of prey that that picks up eagles and other birds when they're injured and so there's opportunities for you to volunteer for a lot of these programs um the the as much as we love wildlife, uh, we've got a staff of three managing 37,000 acres and we don't have a rehab facility. So we cannot act on every nest that falls out of a tree or every squirrel that falls out of its nest. And so those are things that the public can do to help us do our job is to volunteer for organizations that take care of wildlife and rehab and things like that, that um, are very, very important. I'll add that South Carolina DNR has a very active social media presence, so anybody can look at look us up on Facebook or Twitter, or I believe Instagram, <laughs> and find out about everything we do. We're a big agency with involved in a lot of things. So awesome! Thanks. Yeah, I personally am a big fan of uh, South Carolina DNR's social media pages. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pretty pictures. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I wanna say a huge thank you to our panelists. I also wanna thank all the participants for your awesome questions. Um, at this point, I just wanna give a few quick updates um, before we wrap up. So hold on one second. All right, so the Waccamaw Conference is an entire month of events. Um, apart from the webinar series, you can get involved in cleanups. We have one tomorrow in the Waccamaw Wildlife Refuge at the Cox Ferry Landing. Um, and you can learn more about that on the Waccamaw Conference website. We'll put a link in the chat. So just a reminder, there's lots of ways to get involved and um, still more to come. The Waccamaw Conference will go until April 22nd, which is Earth Day. So you can find out about future webinars, cleanup events. We have a bio blitz, a student poster contest. It's all on the Waccamaw Conference website. The link is right here and we'll put it in the chat as well. And the next webinar will be this coming Tuesday, April 20th. It's coming together at Winnea Bay, another panel discussion with representatives of museums, uh, cultural groups, small business organizations around Winnea Bay and the city of Georgetown, really focused on how people can reconnect to their communities. 
Um, so with that, I just want to thank our panelists one more time. And as they mentioned, um, we'll try to put together a list of URLs and links that people can use to find out more. And uh, with that, thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this webinar. Great job, Maeve, thanks. Thanks, Kara.